thank you for the invite. So quick background, uh, so my name is Mohammed Zubair. I work for the University of Manchester uh, and the University of Manchester as sponsor of uh, drug trials, device trials, and anything that the university may consider to be high risk. So what we do here at the University of Manchester, so we have a number of clinical academics uh, who are interested in, always interested in, in getting their studies funded uh, and running clinical trials. And the type of, I mean, so there's always a justification of why you want to run a trial. And primarily with early phase trials, and this is what uh, Translation at Manchester is probably focused on, is usually around safety and efficacy. Those are the two key outcomes of trials. The more earlier phase of trial, the more safety orientated it is with a bit of efficacy and the later phase trials are more pushed towards efficacy as opposed to safety. And fundamentally, when we're approached, we're always interested in what is the justification for the trial that um, you know, our clinical academics want to undertake. And sometimes it's not always clinical academics, it could just be uh, somebody who's lab-based, uh, who's been working on a particular, say, device, product, drug, and they're keen to, to get it into humans. So we start then engaging with them uh, because sponsorship is a legal responsibility uh, to get your trials up and running and, and trialing your products in humans is a heavily regulated area, as you would expect. And there are a number of standards, laws, um, um, and other kind of practices that we need to be familiar with and make the CIs and the research teams familiar with. And these are uh, responsibilities that we as the university have to fulfill. And sponsorship is a legal responsibility, not just in this country, in the uh, EU as well. And really what the organization takes responsibility for is the financing of the trial. So ensuring there's enough money to see the trial from start through to uh, completion, which is usually archiving. Um, ensuring that we've got the appropriate indemnity in place that covers not just our research staff, but also the, uh, the protocol design and any um, impact it may have on um, uh, participants who take part in the trial, where it's not uh, the misconduct of an individual or if some uh, negligence of a, of a clinician, it's actually if something does go wrong because it was the root cause was the way the trial had been designed, that's where our clinical trials insurance applies. And in some cases, certain studies, there are going to be exclusions. So we would help researchers identify appropriate insurance. And also the management of the trial is uh, the responsibility of the sponsor. So we, we actually take on that burden um, as an organization. And that's why we remain tethered to trials from start to finish. So if, you, if you are working on drugs, devices, uh, and that could be you know, repurposing a drug or it could be an advanced therapy, it could be any kind of medical device, physical software and so on. I mean, everybody's going to be familiar with the pipeline and what it takes, as it were, to get it into human and human trials and so on. But something to always bear in mind is not just that point, we've got, you've got a product uh, and it, it's now going to be trialed into in uh, uh, human volunteers, whether healthy or whether it's a particular patient and cohort. You need to actually be aware of what are the licensing um, pathways out there that would allow your drug to be placed on um, 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 and be placed on, onto the market, be either commercially available or be offered by um, you know, healthcare providers um, in a given country. And it's at the moment, there are a number of schemes just to let you know that are available um, um, where you can actually fast track your, say your drugs or your devices as well. Uh, so it's just worth knowing that. So when, when we talk about sponsorship, we always like to, to, to know what the regulatory strategy is going to be for the research team. Now, this is just to give you an indication of uh, the complexities in just setting up a basic trial. And everything in red there is a legal requirement. And, and as I said, the sponsor is ultimately responsible for the trial. So when the research team is undertaking that research activity, whilst the sponsor provides you that legal cover, uh, it's important that the processes that need to be followed are followed appropriately. And that, uh, you know, and that can be verified as well through an audit. 
So whether that's an audit by the sponsor or any third party or a regulator, we have to be able to demonstrate a lot of this activity. And it is heavy going, it can be bureaucratic, um, but the fundamental point of clinical trials is um, you have to be able to verify through documentation um, that something that you, you're saying has been done, including how you follow the protocol, can be evidenced through documentation. So this, this is just to give you an indication of the kind of pathway uh, that can be followed, and, and this is available online. Uh, and this is just to say, yeah, once you've got a, a firm trial design, you've got a firm protocol, stable protocol, what it takes to basically set the trial up. So to understand then why this is complex is because medicines themselves can be complex. They can be varied as well. And there are legal definitions that we abide by when it comes to medicines. And this, this is the UK's definition for what a medicine can be. Um, and as we're seeing now with a lot of science and a lot of uh, sort of cutting edge research, including gene uh, modification therapies, you, you're looking at CRISPR technology, which, uh, which is now being trialed um, um, by different sponsors. We're always sort of pushing at, uh, at this definition and, but it's important to understand actually what your product is. So even if you're developing at a very early stage and, and the hope is to translate it at some point, you have to, you, you've got to be clear in your mind whether it, it really does meet the definition of a medicine or whether it meets the definition of a medical device, which also is varied. And especially now with software, a lot of software being used uh, that does it meet that definition. Um, and if it doesn't, is it potentially a borderline product? So even at the preclinical stage where you're trialing, let's say your, your particular device drug uh, in animal models or other assays, it's important to know um, which pathway you're likely to follow and what it is that you actually are uh, trialing and testing. So it can be complex uh, if, it's, um, if you're not clear about what it is that you're hoping your product will do and what it will achieve. So it's important to have that understanding. And again, uh, a chat with the sponsor team, uh, you, we could sort of guide you through some of the, um, uh, the standards, uh, the, the regulatory requirements and work with you to help you understand what your product is and which regulations will apply. So we have um, uh, plenty of experience now within the University uh, Manchester sponsor team of sponsoring uh, drug trials. Uh, so these could be uh, late phase trials where we're using drugs that already have a marketing authorization, but our researchers feel based on data that they've generated or what they've seen elsewhere that if a product could be used off label for a particular disease specification and they intend to trial it. So we, we have uh, lots of experience in that. And those are kind of the traditional trials we, we tend to see in academia. We're now seeing a lot more experimental medicine uh, applications going into funders. Uh, so biologics is, is a good example of that. And we're beginning to see advanced therapies as well. So the university does sponsor a number of um, early uh, phase or first in human uh, gene therapy uh, trials. So we are developing that experience and expertise here in Manchester as well. Likewise, with medical device trials, you have actually, um, the University of Manchester can have two responsibilities when it comes to running what's called a clinical investigation of a medical device, which is similar to running a drug trial. And one is where the university is just a sponsor, a researcher just wants to trial a device and generate data, but that data may potentially be used to uh, CE mark or UK CA mark um, a device and then commercialize it. Or it could be a device that we actually, I mean, our academics have, um, have manufactured. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean physically put it together, but it's the know-how that they've come up with, where the IP sits with the, with the organization. So, when you're running a clinical investigation, it's worth understanding, are you running it as the sponsor or are you asking the university to be involved as the manufacturer? And in some cases, it could be both. So having that understanding is really, really critical as well because the re regulatory requirements, the legal requirements, 
and associated responsibilities can be different, they can be divergent. And it's important to, um, uh, to know why you're running that study. So just to give you an example of the types of devices that we are currently sponsoring, where the university has or is a manufacturer, are, uh, we see a lot of software uh, applications uh, which meet the definition of a medical device uh, uh, being used um, in various trials, diagnostic assays. And we've also run um, a first in human uh, surgical trial using a, um, a nerve conduit developed from uh, using a novel polymer. So we see, uh, you know, different, so usually devices are, are in three uh, categories, class one, two, and three, or 2A, 2B, and then three, where class three devices are considered to be the most high risk. So we have experience of running uh, clinical investigations with class two, 2A, two and AB, and class three devices as well. And, and, and usually a lot of this has been at that translational uh, end, just, just to make that point known. We have, uh, we sponsor, as I said, high risk um, uh, interventions as well. And that could include surgical interventions, um, using CE mark devices as they should be used. And so on. it could be a combination of drug and device where we're not interested in the safety and efficacy of the drug or device, but actually the surgical intervention itself. So it doesn't neatly fit un, uh, under the previous two categories, but it still requires uh, significant oversight from the sponsor. And likewise, if you're interested in running uh, a study that involves the use of drugs, so it could be your patients are on a particular treatment, but you're not investigating that drug itself, again, um, our sponsor team would be uh, involved in that. Um, uh, trial on in that setup. So in our team, then we've got our specialisms are then medical devices, CTIMPs, ATIMPs, and other types of trials. We work with a couple of pharmacists from Manchester Foundation Trust uh, who work with uh, the university under an SLA and they're the IMP specialists. So they have a particular insight into, you know, they could get your information as to how to manufacture that drug to GMP standard how it should be stored, released, and accountability. So they have significant insight that they can offer you around that. Likewise, we work exceptionally closely with the contracts team here at the University of Manchester. Contracts don't just cover the funding of a, a say a trial, whether it's commercial or non-commercial, it'll cover things such as technical agreements and that cover the supply of a drug or a device. It could be agreements with third party uh, vendors where they're undertaking an activity on behalf of the sponsor. So that could be uh, analysis of um, biosamples where the outcomes of those samples are then informing your primary, secondary outcomes of a trial, which are really, really critical uh, output. So we would get involved with that. Uh, we have experience of auditing these third party vendors, commercial and non-commercial, as well as agreeing divisional responsibilities with these organizations. So contracts is a really, really a critical step and, and we remain quite closely tied in with our contracts team. We equally work, uh, equally work very closely with the research support managers at the funding stage. So where you're getting your application ready to put it into the funder, we'll work with them and make them aware of various costs that um, uh, researchers should be aware of. And likewise, we, we, we work quite closely with the business engagement team, especially in commercial studies. For example, a company might be giving you free material. And likewise, as I said earlier, the insurance um, is, is a key component of sponsorship because our insurance policy does have key exclusions that researchers need to be aware of. And that includes uh, pregnant women uh, and neonates. So if you're doing any research in that area, uh, it's always useful to, to touch base with us so we can then guide you as to what the appropriate insurance policy may be. Likewise, if you want to run your study abroad, then there are clear exclusions in that policy. So we would work with you to find appropriate local insurance. Now, we, whilst we've got a good handle and, and good idea of what the regulatory um, pathways are for these drugs and some of the issues that come up, with because a lot of translational research is doing something for the first time, it pushes up the boundaries of the, uh, of the regulations. What we don't know, and, and that could be many things, we do, we are tied in with, uh, uh, with the UK uh, sponsor network. 
which is made up of the Russell Group universities. So we can always reach out to uh, other partners and see what their experience is uh, in terms of uh, surmounting, say, regulatory issues or obtaining appropriate approvals or contractual issues. And likewise, we also engage directly with the regulators in this country. So the HRA is responsible for ethics and ethical approval, and the MHRA is the medicines um, health regulatory authority. So they will give you approvals for drug and device trials as well. In terms of um, what I would like to see uh, come out of this is to, to is we're keen to translate more research here in Manchester I and mean, compared with other uh, Russell Group universities, uh, they may be stronger in that area, but you know we're, we're keen to now sort of help researchers get those um, uh, their research translated earlier. Um, the regulatory strategy is a really key component of you know, of any kind of product device that you're working on. So. And depending on which technology or material you're using, we would like to hear from you so we can understand um, you know, how you intend to get that product to clinic. It could be easy to think about, uh, you know, we're only going to work on products in a sort of segmented way, but actually without understanding the full regulatory pathway, uh, there's a possibility that your trials may not generate the relevant data that you need, that those endpoints may not be appropriate and therefore may never be funded um, um, by a healthcare provider um, in any kind of jurisdiction. So it's important to understand of what value your, your research is likely to be. And I think having that early conversation can actually uh, allow you to you know, uh, tailor your research strategy to make sure that you're actually considering the appropriate endpoints um, uh, for your treatments. So is it just modification of a gene or some other kind of uh, output, or are you looking at maybe improving quality of life, which actually does have an economic uh, dimension associated with it. So things like that are, are quite important uh, for you to consider. We're, we would like to hear from researchers as early as possible, because if you're working on these new technologies and these new materials, uh, and if we don't have uh, much experience with it, it allows us and gives us time to then reach out to other organizations and the regulators and say, this is likely to be coming your way. What do we need to be aware of? Uh, and where are those pinch points that, you know, that we need to address in the applications that we make to the regulators uh, so that they can get through? And as I said, uh, there are these early access schemes now within UK, EU, and uh, the US. And what we're asking researchers to consider now is, you know, are you able to bypass the traditional uh, pipeline of getting your drug through an early phase to late phase trials and then getting your license by using some of these early access schemes which are uh, out there which are uh, live as well at the moment so there may be sort of other ways of getting um, a product out there a lot quicker than the usual 10 15 20 year period especially in light of what we've seen with uh, with covid and, and covid related research very recently so what i you know, we'd be more than happy for you to contact us directly on our um, uh, medical devices um, email address or the clinical trials email address or if there's anything else that you're working on you're not sure where it may fit in just you know just reach out to us directly as i said we have experience of uh, of sponsorship we've, we've done many you know first in human studies uh, here in manchester and whilst all of this is quite risky um, the biggest risk we have is when somebody turns up with a pot of money and says, you know, can you sponsor this study? And that's, a, you know, that can be a, a big difficulty and it can clog up your research because the delays um, um, will basically mean that you may not finish your study to time and target and therefore you will not be able to answer your primary secondary outcomes. And, and that's a big risk because clinical trials are very rarely repeated especially early phase trials. So with that, I'm going to end. And if there are any questions, I'll happily take them. Thank you.